Let me first talk about fluoride in general and give you an idea in overall terms what fluoridation of public water supplies is doing to the people of the United States right now. We're chronically poisoning over 150 million Americans by means of fluoridation of public water supplies. 25 million of them have been so badly poisoned that you can see white chalky areas on their teeth. This is the first symptom of fluoride poisoning called dental fluorosis. A large number of the 40 million arthritics in this country are due, are suffering from arthritis as a result of fluoride in the water supply. We have about 2 million people who are allergic or experience hypersensitive reactions to fluoride. Uh, we have about 35,000, an estimated 35,000 deaths a year, that's 100 deaths a day, due to fluoridation of public water supplies. And over 10,000 of those 30,000, 35,000, are due to the effect of fluoride in inducing cancer and cancer death. Uh, that's an overall viewpoint. I won't be able to go into the biochemistry of all of this, but uh, since my t subject is fluoridation and cancer, I'll go into that. First of all, uh, how many people here know what an enzyme is? Anybody? Can somebody give me an answer? What is an enzyme? It's a protein. What else? It's a catalyst. What it does is it facilitates reactions in our body that make life possible. In other words, in our body we can burn sugar, which normally would require hundreds and hundreds of degrees to burn. We can burn it at 98.6 degrees centigrade. It's responsible, these enzymes are responsible for the breakdown of foods, release of calories and energy, the buildup of cell components, the breakdown of older cell components, responsible for rejuvenation, uh, responsible for repair of our body, responsible for excretion of waste products from our body. Virtually everything in our body is under physiological control of these very important proteins called enzymes. Now, fluoride inhibits, at one part per million, fluoride inhibits over 10 that we know of and probably well in it, and we're talking about the amount that's used to fluoride in public water supplies, an estimated 100 or more other enzymes. One of the most important enzymes <clears throat> with regard to cancer is an enzyme system called the DNA repair enzyme system. This enzyme system exists in the nucleus or the nuclei of every one of the cells in our body with the exception of red blood cells which don't have a nucleus. But every cell that has a nucleus in our body and has genetic material has a DNA repair enzyme system. One part per million fluoride, which is the amount they add to public water supplies, inhibits this enzyme system by 50%. Now, the importance of this is that if we're taking a walk out in the sun and ultraviolet light falls on our skin, if we take something in our diet that happens to cause chromosomal damage or might cause cancer, we have the ability within each one of our cells to repair the damage done and that ability is reduced by 50% just by drinking fluoridated water. Now, in addition to that, I would say there are about close to 40 papers showing that fluoride at levels down to and including the amount used to fluoridate public water supplies causes genetic damage. The effects of genetic damage can be varied. The cell can die, which is probably the best thing that could happen because you no longer have that cell to deal with. It's not going to become a cancer cell. It's not going to put bad things into the person's body. Or it can make that cell become toxic, which means that by means of damaging one of the regulatory sites on that genetic material, enzymes will be produced that will crank out substances which are toxic to the body, leading to degenerative diseases. And this is what happens in the, in the case of dental fluorosis and arthritis uh, as a result of fluoride's effect. What also can happen if, if this genetic damage occurs in a sperm cell or an egg cell and can lead to birth defects. And the horrible thing about these birth defects is they will be carried on from generation to generation to generation. These pieces of damage that fluoride does to our genetics become permanent. And as long as that cell line continues, that flaw will continue for generation upon generation, even if none of the future generations even drink fluoridated water. And then finally, if 
Fluoride causes damage at the part of the genetic material which controls cell growth. You have a break and no longer will that cell be able to have its growth controlled and it will result in a tumor. And if the tumor excretes proteolytic enzymes to digest away other cells, it becomes a malignant tumor or what we refer to as cancer. Now in 1963, as early as 1963, doctors Herskowitz and Norton found, and by the way, Dr. Herskowitz is a well-known geneticist. He's published nine textbooks on genetics. He and his co-worker, Dr. Norton, found that as they increased fluoride in the medium of their animals, they could increase tumor incidence from 12 to 100 percent. In other words, they could induce tumors in 100 percent of their animals. In 1963, in 1965, doctors Taylor and Taylor from the University of Texas at Austin, at the Clayton Biochemical Research Institute, that's where Roger Williams is from, found that one part per million in the water of fluoride increased tumor growth rate by 25 percent. Now before I go into explaining why this happened, let me also explain that fluoride at one part per million inhibits the immune system by from 30 to 70 percent. So by means of destroying our genetic repair system, we've destroyed in large part, or impaired in large part, our primary defense mechanism against cancer. And now we've destroyed a large part of the immune system. We have now destroyed the secondary defense mechanism, which is the immune system. And this is exactly what Taylor and Taylor found out. That they would inject a small amount of cancer cells, have one part of their animals drink non-fluoridated water, the other drink fluoridated water, and tumor growth rate would be enhanced by 25% because the immune system could no longer effectively or as effectively hold back the tumor growth rate. That was in 1965. In the 70s, a number of studies come, came out showing additional work from Columbia University, from University of Missouri, showing genetic damage from, can, from fluoride. And then in 1974 and 1975, Dr. Dean Burke, who was the former chief chemist of the National Cancer Institute, and by the way, one of the recipients of Cancer Control Society's Humanitarian Award, and myself started studies which showed that we could find, and we did find, after very extensive epidemiological studies, over 10,000 excess cancer deaths in areas that were fluoridated as compared to those that were not fluoridated. We looked at somewhere in the order, well over a million cancer deaths, and looked before fluoridation in either group of cities occurred, no difference in cancer death rate or death rate trends. Shortly after, within two or three to five years after fluoridation, a marked divergence with the fluoridated city's cancer death rate going up substantially. We corrected for various variables such as age, race, and sex of the population and found and confirmed. And in three out of four court cases in this country proved by a preponderance of the evidence that fluoridation caused chronic toxic effects, genetic damage, and cancer. And these cases were heard between 1978 and 1982. The decisions came out, and we'll talk about the politics later on. But we were able to prove by a preponderance of the evidence. And we had, we had people from the National Cancer Institute, uh, National Academy of Sciences, Royal Statistical Society, Royal College of Physicians coming in against us. And the judges in these cases gave overwhelming, overwhelming support to the fact that we were able to show the link and no one could question it. In 1977, Congress held hearings, two days of hearings on the work of Dr. Burke and myself, and at that time instigated with the National Toxicology Program. By the way, if this whole thing, the whole, when our studies were coming out, the National Cancer Institute was making bogus claims that our studies didn't make certain corrections. During the congressional hearings, it was found that the National Cancer Institute, along with the Royal College of Physicians and Royal Statistical Society, were involved in the conspiracy and actually published as independent studies data that was erroneous and supplied by our own U.S. National Cancer Institute to the British workers. This was brought out in the hearings and they said, we can no longer go with this. We're telling the National Cancer Institute to go back 
do additional research, and three years from now, 1980, we want studies on animal studies to find out whether fluoride causes cancer or not. I was supposed to be on the protocol committee. <laughs> I never was. 1980, no results came out. In 1982, we found they were starting their studies. In 1984, 85, they said the studies didn't come out right, so we have to redo them. But in the meantime, in Japan in 1984, a group of uh, investigators headed by Dr. Tsutsui found they could transform normal cells into cancer cells merely by exposure of these cells to fluoride. And it occurred within a matter of days because they used slightly higher concentrations. They used 30 parts per million instead of one part per million. And uh, the uh, National Cancer Institute was still working away on their so-called studies. In 1988, Argonne National Laboratories, which is one of the most prestigious laboratories in the country, confirmed the Japanese work, which is published in Cancer Research, and stated not only did we find that fluoride caused cancer, but also that it stimulated cancer caused by other cancer-causing substances, published in 1988. Finally, we got leaks from Battelle Memorial Institute, which was doing the study for the U.S. Public Health Service. And those leaks were, first, that fluoride appeared to be, at least in male rats, responsible for an increase in bone cancer. And then after that, in getting Battelle's data, we found that fluoride was definitely linked to a rare form of liver cancer called hepatocalangiocarcinoma. Never occurs in untreated animals only when carcinogens are given. And as the fluoride concentration went up, this rare form of liver cancer went up. Never reported, except we have the data now from Battelle. And we also found in male and female rats an increase in oral tumors and cancers as the fluoride concentration went up. In 1990, this hit the press. And uh, there was, you know, equivocal link between fluoride and bone cancer, but none of the most important cancers were mentioned. And because this concerned our friends of the Public Health Service who had been promoting fluoridation since 1950, Dr. James Mason, who is notorious for making fraudulent statements in the area of fluoridation anyhow, called, and by the way, he's your top health officer right now. I remember one time a congressman asked about Dean Burke, uh, is it true that Dean Burke is an uh, uh, eminent chemist of the National Cancer Institute. He said, no, he worked for the Canadian National Cancer Institute. And it took a threat by Dean Burke of a suit against Mason to make him admit that Dean Burke did work for the National Cancer Institute of the United States. And he is now your top health officer. He is Undersecretary of Health for Health and Human Services. Now, I've heard people at these lectures say, cooperate with the National Cancer Institute. Cooperate with the U.S. Public Health Service. Let me tell you, the people in charge, in my opinion, are absolutely corrupt. You cannot trust them, ladies and gentlemen. They're in bed with some evil elements, and I don't know all the ramifications. But you cannot, you cannot expect a fair shake from these people. So, I was, so he started this committee with, uh, how many people heard of Frank Young, former FDA commissioner? Yes. Frank Young was put at the head of the committee, and in the committee were a bunch of the people who had promoted fluoridation for all these years to do an independent analysis, another whitewash committee. In between time, the National Cancer Institute had done studies among human male populations to see if this bone cancer that was found in male rats could be found in males. They found the incidence of bone cancer in males, published in 1991, was 50% higher in fluoridated areas. That study was given to this committee, headed by Frank Young and a bunch of the lackeys. And the result was, we can now assure the American public that fluoride doesn't cause cancer. 1991. So I got a call from Frank Young. He said, John, he said, I thought you might be interested in seeing our report and maybe want to meet with me here for a couple of hours in Washington, D.C. And I said, great, Frank. I said, I'm going to send you some questions that I want to answer before we meet about 40, 50 questions. Embarrassed, he couldn't answer the questions. I said, well, what's the sense in meeting? He said, well, come on down anyhow. And I did, and I have a two-hour tape of our meeting. And believe me, they don't know what they're doing. Not only are they corrupt, 
they're also ignorant. And if this ignorance can be brought to light, we're in good shape. We have a government overall that's in shambles. It's not only in health and human services. Since 1985, I have been advisor to the president of the, profession, worker, the Union of Professional Workers and Scientists at the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, Bob Carton is one of the people I've worked with. And over the years, despite the fact that their administrators have said that Florida is absolutely safe, last year, I think it was in Lancet, the British Medical Journal, the chief toxicologist for the Bureau of Drinking Water admitted that fluoridation causes cancer, citing my work and additional work that we did showing that fluoride doesn't even reduce tooth decay when added to the water supply. This was in the Lancet. And he was told from making these statements that he might lose his job. Thank goodness there was a union there to protect him. I met with uh, Bob Carton a couple of weeks ago at a convention we had in Columbus, Ohio. And he said, John, he said, we only have about a year and a half before they throw all of us out. Now we have PhDs who are trained, who are being told by people who have degrees in Chinese literature what to tell the public about fluoride. You've got to ask yourself where these people are getting their marching orders. And the union has taken fluoride as its number one issue because it is so clearly evident that there's fraud there. Where now, how many people saw that uh, program on 60 Minutes uh, on the mercury amalgam fillings? Okay, I helped put that together, and I think it was probably one of the best shows on our, on our side that I've ever seen. I think they did an excellent job. We have and are working now with members of the American Dental Association, ADA has supported fluoridation for years, who are suing the American Dental Association for fraud and breach of contract with regard to statements they've made with regard to fluoride, fluoridation, and mercury. And one of the things I'm going to be asking for today is your support. Uh, do we have uh, any of these? Uh, have these been passed out yet? Okay, these are forms that I'd like you to, to have. I'll have them passed out. And I'll tell you about something about the case. But before I go to that, I just want to say that we are not dealing with science anymore. We're dealing with politics. As you probably know here, many, many, of the uh, uh, therapies that have been used have proven successful. So we're not, we're not really trying to prove our case with regard to whether these, whether these methods work or not. What we're doing is we're dealing with people whose money is coming from not us, the taxpayer, but somewhere else. Or there's a revolving door between the Food and Drug Administration or the Public Health Service and the industries they're supposed to regulate. But as I said, this is not only true in the Department of Health and Human Services. The Environmental Protection Agency is a separate division and it's also occurring there. And it's also beyond the health and environmental area. Now let me tell you something, and I think many of you realize this. We don't treat symptoms. Fluoridation is nothing more, and what's happened to the fluoridation issue is nothing more than a microcosm or a small piece of what's happening overall. I can tell you some of the things that I've done in the past. How many people live in Los Angeles? How many people realize that your water is not fluoridated in Los Angeles? Do you realize why? Okay, one of the reasons is because I was brought into Los Angeles and conducted your political campaign to stop fluoridation in 1975. And I'm happy to say in many other parts of the country, I, with the help of many of you, have been able to stop fluoridation. In 1985, we stopped it in San Antonio, Texas, against unbelievable odds. Everyone there wanted to fluoridate it. But the interesting thing, the person who, surprisingly, the person who helped lead the campaign was working as a volunteer for the American Cancer Society, and was disturbed to find out that they were going to go ahead and fluoridate the water there. And she threw down all her volunteer work and went out and led the campaign and called me in to help him to stop fluoridation. We're out spent 15 to 1, and we won. 